Now, Moore's Law may be dead, but mankind's appetite never will be. So, what happens now that Moore's Law is dead? You know, what do we do with silicon? We're already at 7 nanometer. Uh, 6 nanometers next year. TSMC should be on 5 nanometer by 2022. And they're already developing 3 nanometer, and it's on track. So let's let's be optimistic, say that's 2024. And they're already researching 2 nanometer, which is probably where it stops. I know that theoretically we can get to 1 nanometer, and maybe there will be a node that they market as 1 nanometer. But 2 nanometer in 2026, 2027, that's probably where we're stopping. And... As such, we need to move to a material that can scale lower. Or at least that seems to be what most people think. And this was a Patreon-requested subject from quite a while ago. Actually, that RDNA video was, too, that I just did. And I'm working through it now. I'm now going to look into what we can do past silicon. But why do we even use silicon, and what can we even use? Well, first of all, there are five group four elements on the periodic table that are, well, I wouldn't say perfect, but applicable candidates for uh, mass-producing complex circuitry, what we do with CPUs and GPUs. So, a group four element is used because their outer electron shells are half full, so they're in the middle, and with the addition of a tiny amount of other elements, the material can be slightly biased towards less or more than half full. In other words, these are materials that can easily be inert, and once you apply some electricity, they can switch, right? On, off. Ones and zeros. That's how silicon, well, that's how circuitry works. And these elements are silicon, which we use, tin, lead, germanium, and carbon. Now, let's go through them. Tin and lead, we're not using... It should be fairly obvious to anyone with an engineering background why a lead CPU would be a horrible decision, and tin as well. But I think you guys understand these are cheaper metals that really have a lot of... Well, properties that are negative for what we're trying to accomplish. So I won't cover them. But actually, the first CPU used germanium that's right and germanium was ditched kind of early because it stores less voltage it, it can't be caught and because of that it can't be clocked as high um and frankly silicon's cheaper so if silicon can be clocked higher and it's cheaper it, it was just decided that we'll go with that after the first few CPUs were made. But for all intents and purposes, we could make germanium CPUs right now. They would just be more expensive and clocked lower. But our factories could probably retool to use them if they needed to. But that's not really that interesting, is it? The next one we would probably want to use then is carbon, specifically carbon nanotubes. If we're going to use carbon to get the best properties out of it that you could imagine, you would want to use these hyper-specific engineered structures. The problem is that carbon nanotubes are not conducive to mass production, and that's a... Th thing that's going to pop up more and more it's not just can you make this but then can you also make it better and not just better but significantly better and then most importantly how many of these goddamn things can i spit out per second and it's not per second but hours right now with carbon nanotubes you have to basically slowly grow them upwards specifically to make that structure and then swipe it onto a flat surface theoretically this could work but remember silicon was chosen pretty quickly not quite arbitrarily but they found a couple properties quickly and said all right silicon fine we're going with that that's why they chose silicon over germanium but then there were 40 years of incredible improvements improvements that aren't just guessing and checking but are you know r d specific physics-based discoveries about the silicon element and starting from scratch to do something that is gonna at least out of the gate be insanely slow 
It's just not going to work. Intel needs to make millions of processors per year. They can't just make a thousand and then sell them for more unless someone's willing to pay a hundred million dollars for it. But it's like, why? You just make a big room of pro. It, there's no point, right? You would just make a server room instead of getting this expensive thing. So for now, carbon nanotubes really just don't seem to be the answer. Although again, theoretically, we'll see there could be breakthroughs. And now we have graphene, something many people have probably heard about. Now, graphene's actually quite interesting because I see some hope here. Um, it can use, for the most part, the standard manufacturing processes we use right now with silicon. A huge deal. Additionally, it is much, much easier to conduct heat away, which would allow us to cool it substantially easier, more efficiently, and clock it higher. Okay, so already this sounds great. Uh, but the problem is graphene, a sheet of graphene to be used for a processor needs to have zero imperfections. And at least at the moment, we can't really do that, <laughs> at least not for an entire chip. Like these experiments, you know, they see, oh, here's a test where this graphene chip, you know, be like a scientific journal, did this, and it was that much better than silicon. But what they're not telling you is it's either a minuscule, tiny processor that can't even compete with atoms from Intel, or it, they had to glue many of them together, and I mean a lot. But, you know, we use chiplets now. So in the future, it, we lower the imperfections. We use chiplets. I, I, I like graphene. I really like it. I like what this can do. Although, there is a problem here in that it is a almost too good of a conductor. Now, silicon conducts once you apply 0.7 volts. If you're wondering why some processors and graphics cards when you're undervolting always seem to have a wall at about 800 millivolts, yeah, guys, that's why. It's not a coincidence. You go below 0.7, theoretically, the graphics card can't boot. That's why the lowest you can usually go with undervolting, if you have an amazing chip, is like point. Well, it usually is 800 millivolts, right? I know with my Vega cards, when I overclock them, uh, the amount of stability I gained from going from 800 to 805 millivolts was like a factor of 10. Like it was the difference between 800 megahertz core and 1,000. It was hilarious. But that's actually good because then it can be inert. It cannot be applying voltage unless you want it to. And graphene effectively works like a metal. Now, this is a problem I think we can solve. But as you hear in here, there's a few hurdles, right? But they're solvable. So graphene's one of those ones where it's like, I think this might go somewhere. But let's not assume it's going to be here in a decade. Or at least not in five years. Now, there is a new kid on the block. And actually, my brother mentioned it. We discussed it a little in the podcast. Broken silicon. Please listen to it. It's called molybdenum disulfide. And this can also use the standard manufacturing product. Process, and it also has acceptable conductivity properties. Okay, so it sounds like a graphene that works, doesn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't have as many benefits as graphene theoretically would have. Although I think this is something we may go to. So it's like, it's all a matter of cost, right? And that brings me to the major point. That point is this. When you bring up a new way of making processors or graphics cards or any of these complex circuitry chips, does it cost more? Well, yes, of course. It's new technology. How much more? Ten times more? It's probably a thousand times more. And that's a problem because we've been able to scale CPUs at least far enough that space isn't as much of a concern. It's definitely a concern. You have these supercomputers taking up entire warehouses, but it's not like before, you know, by before I mean like in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, where if you wanted a supercomputer equivalent to now, you'd have to take up an entire country. We do have enough open space to make these bigger if we have to. And so if it costs a thousand times more, it's just straight up not worth it. And like I said before, we've had 40 
years of improvements to silicon itself. So you're starting from scratch. So you have to beat a 40-year mature material, which is, not, is an incredibly tall order. But even worse, and this is the thing I've never seen anyone else mention, even worse is the idea that not only do you have to be better than silicon with its 40 years of improvements, but you also then have to say, oh, there's a chance this has at least 20 years of improvements. Because silicon continues to get better. And if you become four times better than silicon and cost a th you know, 10 times more, there will be some use cases for that. But silicon's not going to stop improving. So then you need to take graphene and say, can we improve this for 20 years? Well, I guess you'll never know unless you try, but that is a major, major problem hurdle there to anyone even attempting this stuff i mean we're not talking about tens of billions we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars to make something that may be a little better more expensive to sell and then you just hope you don't hit another dead end right theoretically silicon can go to one nanometer well i think we'll probably stop at two but let's say we get to one and graphing can go to half a nanometer that's it one more node is that worth hundreds of billions of dollars Probably not. And that is the chicken and egg situation we are stuck in. And of course, this is when people would bring up quantum computing and maybe other sort of esoteric and convoluted solutions. But the fact of the matter is, I actually did a lot of research on quantum computers last year, early last year, as the, you know, as it became at least abundantly clear to me that cryptocurrencies were here to stay. I mean, I thought they were beforehand, but the proof was in the pudding when you had that much buzz going. And so I said, I keep seeing people bring up quantum computers in terms of hacking passwords and code. And where are we? And the, the fact of the matter is we're nowhere near these things being ready for prime time. We're talking about things that are only really capable of factoring like nine numbers and anything complex is a shit show. These things are easily, in my opinion, 20 years away from being ready for prime time. And I think prime time, I guess pun intended there, prime time because of prime numbers will really only be in factoring and code hacking. I, I actually am not that excited for quantum computers. I am a little worried they'll only be useful for brute forcing your passwords. When it comes to other tasks, though, there's no proof they can do anything better than the standard ones and zero CPUs we have now. However, don't get mad at me. I'm going to do a video on quantum computers where I do much more research. That's just what my current opinion is, and I want to stick to the materials on this one. So at the end of the day, the conclusion I am actually coming to is this. Yes, eventually we will get new materials. And at least at the moment, I think graphene looks great and molybdenum disulfide also looks good. But that M disulfide is only the newest kit on the block. So there will probably be other materials that pop up as well. Whatever the case may be, there will be some new material eventually. Eventually, the money will be worth it. But the problem is that might be 10 years or more from now, contrary to what a lot of people seem to think. And the reason I say that is there's still so much we can do with existing silicon that will be cheaper than moving to a new material. That's my conclusion. Think about it, right? Where, you know... We are able to get at least a few more big die shrinks coming. Um, and after that, there are some gigantic improvements we can make to something called cold computing. Cold computing is just the idea that, well, if you've ever seen any of these hardcore overclocking with liquid nitrogen people, you'll see things like they'll get an i7 to 6 gigahertz and it'll be using 0.8, you know, millivolt you know it'll be using 800 millivolts and you'll go wait that's all it needs so think about that if we improved thermal conductivity and heat removal well enough we could cut power consu consumption down to a fourth while clocking our chips 20 percent faster that's better than a node that's better than a new node that's something we should be working on and we are 3d stacking also removes latency allows us to make chips that are more powerful you know if you can make a very thin transistor and then stack it so it fits in the same laptop 
much more performance. There's many more things that we can do that are going to be just astronomically cheaper than moving to a new manufacturing element or structure type. And then I get to my final argument, too, which is a... Uh, many will hate this argument, but do we need like a hundred times more performance? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Like where we are now, we're probably halfway to photorealism. Like we're almost there. And there are at least three more big die shrinks coming. Five nanometer, three nanometer, two nanometer. These three die shrinks should double density, cut power consumption in half. 2 times 2 times 2. That's an 8x increase. It might take a decade to get there because Moore's Law is dead, but we will get there, people. And, well, the clock speeds won't increase as we shrink them, and they may even constrict a little bit. Power usage will be cut in half. They will be larger, effectively, dies where we can fit many more transistors. We can go wide here, people. So... I guess what I'm saying is if we're maybe a fourth or half the performance of photorealistic gaming, why won't it be enough to 8x that performance? We'll be at photorealism then. And with chiplets, we can combine more powerful chips that take up less room as well. Chiplets that can be 3D stacked. I mean, I think we can get another 100x in performance over the next 30 years or so just using silicon. And that is my conclusion after looking at all of this. Eventually, we will probably move to graphene or something like that, but they need more time to cook. And frankly, we have the time to give them. Okay, well, that was quite a lot, wasn't it? I hope you liked this video. As I said earlier, this is a Patreon suggested one from one of my premium Patreon members. I am working through those suggestions. All of them, people. But there's just been a lot of news. And this seemed like a good week where there wasn't quite as much news. You know, the calm before the Zen 2 storm. Where I thought this would be a good time to get one of these interesting subjects out there. Please, if you want to make suggestions for videos like this, support me on Patreon as a premium member. All members of my Patreon get access to the Discord to talk to some really, really quite intelligent people about what's going on. Including me. You can talk to me about this video in detail, back and forth conversation when it comes out. And if you can't do that, hey, share this video and like it seriously Just and subscribe if you want. Those three things at once, it helps a lot. It really does. All right. Thank you.